Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Glad you're all here to worship with us today. I'm going to read out of Luke this morning, the first chapter, starting in verse 26. The birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be? I am a virgin. At this time of year, as we enter this season to celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we go back in Scripture and see that God is in control in every step of the way. And our God is so great, and he can help you and take care of all the needs that you have. As this, as this Scripture shows us, God was in control, and we need to let him have control of our life. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to have another day to worship you in this house. Father, I pray that for each and every person that's here, that we can set aside our troubles and our fears and our concerns, and we can focus on uh, the worship and the word that will be presented in a few moments. I pray, Lord, that the things we do have going on, that we'll give to you, and we'll say, have your will with my life, and, let, and we will let you lead us and guide us, because your will is true and perfect. We thank you so much for you sending your son Jesus to the cross to die for our sins, Lord. And I pray that we will forever continue to be thinking about that and sharing that good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ with those around us. In your son's name we pray, amen. Please stand and let's sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. <laughs>
some singing. I love that song. As we enter this offertory time, I just want to, again, extend a thank you to all of you for how you give to this church with your tithes and offerings and, and gifts and talents. And as we are finishing up toward the end of the year, there are still a couple of, couple of Sundays that you can continue to give if you choose to do so or haven't done so and want to. And I just want to say thank you for what you do. Um, last night we had our Christmas party for the student ministries group, and then today we had 15 kids in student ministries this morning. And that's, uh, it's growing, and I just want to say thank you because the, of what you give allows us to have these programs going on and, and Sunday nights as well. So thank you very much. It's exciting to see students coming and hearing about Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we enter this time where we give back to you, and we say thank you. We thank you for how you've given to us, and we're able to give back to you. And Father, what we give back to you, those, those portions go to support the programs, to support the uh, outreach to students and to children and to adults, Lord. And it lets us share the gospel of, of your son, the good news. And Father, I pray that we will be good stewards of those funds, Lord, and that we will continue to be a lighthouse and we'll continue to share with those around us the need to hear about your son, Jesus. I pray a blessing upon each and every person here today, Lord, and say thank you for them. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing Angels We Have Heard on High.
Our scripture reading this morning is James chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so, you, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. So a big day today as we are able to celebrate the incarnation. We're able to, in a little bit, we'll be observing the Lord's Supper together for the final time this year. And then after our worship gathering this morning, we will be having a very brief member meeting as we look forward to the new year, 2022, and what God has for us as his church. So let's bow our heads and our hearts together and ask him to bless the preaching of his word this morning. Father, we are grateful for your love poured out for us in Jesus Christ, that he took on human flesh, he humbled himself, he became a man, he endured the same kind of temptations that we endure, he completely fulfilled your law perfectly, never once sinned, and was raised on a cruel tree to be persecuted for our sins. He died. He was laid in the ground. But on the third day, he was raised from the, de from the dead in order to conquer death for all of us who place our faith in him alone. Father, as we think about this incarnation time, we look forward to your great coming where you will receive your people to yourself. And until that day, you call us to be faithful. So I pray as we come to your word this morning, that through it, you would help us to be more faithful. Help us to love you more. Help us to value what you value, to obey as you've called us to obey. Father, I pray that you would bless the preaching of your word, even as you have blessed the reading of it, that you might be glorified in all things. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, we are wrapping up the book of James. Today we're looking at verses 1 through 11 of James chapter 5. And I'm going to ask you if you have your scripture journals to turn there or to turn in your Bibles if you don't have your scripture journals today. Next week we'll be looking at a Christmas passage as we celebrate the incarnation together. And then we'll conclude our time in James on the final Sunday of the year. It's been good for my heart so far to be in the book of James. I trust it's been good for your heart as well. And I pray that our last two weeks in James will also be profitable. Now as we've walked through the book of James, we've talked a little bit about the background of the church that originally received this letter. Now, these Jewish believers have been scattered across the ancient world. And because they had been displaced from Jerusalem, many of them didn't have good jobs. They were poor. It was not at all uncommon 
that the rich would take advantage of the poor in their day. See, the wealthy landowners would exploit the poor in their vulnerable state, and they would squeeze as much money and profit out of them as they could. And part of the reason that James had written this letter is to encourage these believers in their oppressed state. They needed encouragement that God was doing something good and beneficial in their lives, even as they were being taken advantage of by wealthy unbelievers. See, some of the passages we've looked at in the past few months have alluded to this problem. But the one we're looking at today addresses it head on. James wants to give these believers hope in the midst of their persecution. And maybe you're here this morning and you're struggling because things in your life are not going as you would want them to go. If five years ago you were to map out where you would be today, you would never have put yourself where you are right now. And you're frustrated by that. Maybe your life has had a lot more struggles in the past year than you ever thought possible. And you're wondering what the point of it all is. What is God doing in your life? How does he want you to respond? Well, the believers that James was writing to were facing a significant amount of persecution. And the passage that we're looking at today addresses how to have patience in persecution. And the way that James approaches this is by showing us a profile of the persecutors in verses 1 through 6. And then he shows us a profile of the patient in verses 7 through 11. So those are really the two hooks on which you can hang this message. Today, you may not be facing persecution. But as we look at the profile of the persecutors, we need to take a hard look and evaluate whether we resemble the people who were oppressing the church in James' day. Because you see, folks, even though they were unbelievers it's possible for believers to fall into patterns of sin. And we don't want to be characterized by sins that James condemns harshly in this passage. And as we look at the profile of the patient, I believe that James will give us several things to help us view our circumstances in a more spiritually mature manner so that we can endure whatever kind of pain God is allowing us to face in our lives right now. So first, we're going to see a profile of the persecutors in verses 1 through 6. Now in these verses, we're going to see four things about the ones persecuting James's church. Again, these persecutors are unbelievers. And their sins are characteristic of people who don't view life from a spiritually mature perspective. And as believers, we don't want these things to be true of us. So let's begin reading the first three verses of James chapter 5. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Now, folks, obviously, James is writing to his church, which is scattered across the world. That's why over and over again throughout this book, he has called them brothers or beloved brothers. But here he begins a section by saying, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. 
And folks, this sounds like a rather harsh thing to say to your beloved brothers, doesn't it? If you're thinking that, then you're right. James isn't talking to his church members in these verses. He's talking to the unbelieving rich who were oppressing his church members. Now, why would he do that? Why do you think these wealthy unbelievers would even read James's letter to his church? Well, folks, the truth is they probably won't. And even though this section is addressed to them, it's not really for them. It's actually for the church. These verses are written in the same kind of style that the Old Testament prophets wrote their condemnations of the wicked nations surrounding Israel. Those prophets weren't really writing for the benefit of those wicked nations. They were writing for the benefit of God's people. The prophets were encouraging God's people with the understanding that God was going to judge those wicked nations. And so the people of God could be patient in the understanding that God wasn't ignoring their problems. Well, folks, in a similar way, James is writing to these wealthy unbelievers, but he's doing it for the benefit of his church members. He wants them to see that God knows their struggles. He's working behind the scenes to bring about good through those struggles. And because God is going to address the problem of these persecutors, God's people can be patient and trust that God is working. That's what James is doing here when he directly addresses these rich unbelievers. He doesn't expect them to read this letter, but he expects his church members to read it and to take comfort in the message. So James begins by saying, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Folks, this is a direct warning of judgment that's coming soon. Weep and howl because judgment for your actions is absolutely certain. And it's nothing that anyone is going to want to face. So what have they done? What bad things are these wealthy unbelievers guilty of? And what should we avoid doing if we want to avoid the same kind of threatening message? Well, he says, your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. See, folks, in James's day, some of the earliest forms of wealth would have been food, clothing, and precious metals. It appears that James addresses all three in this verse here. Your riches of food have rotted. They've spoiled. Your huge storehouses of food supplies have all gone bad. And your clothes have been destroyed by moths. Now this is a common problem in the New Testament. If you remember, Jesus said this in Matthew 6, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We've all heard those verses. We all know those verses that Jesus speaks Your food is spoiled, your clothes are moth-eaten, and your precious metals, your gold and your silver, have corroded. Now folks, I don't know if we have any metallurgists in here. I certainly am not one. Do we? Look at that. I did not expect that. That was cool. (laughs) Well, technically, and you would know this, right? 
gold and silver are not going to corrode in the sense that they're not going to get rust, right? But that's not the point that James is making in this passage, right? That's not what he's trying to communicate is that they literally have rust on them. What James is saying here is that these people have these huge barns of food, these luxurious closets full of expensive clothes and these metals that are so valuable in this world. But none of these things can go with you to the next. Not a one of them. And because you can't take any of them with you, their value is fading. It's fleeting. And folks, putting all of your value in things that won't last forever is foolish. God, God is saying here, gold may not rust in this life, but it can't go with you to the next life. So it actually will rust subjectively and be worthless as far as you're concerned. You can't use it in the next life. And if you're only laying up for yourself treasures in this life, then you're doing exactly what the unbelieving rich are doing in these verses. You're putting all of your efforts into a life that's quickly passing away from you. And since your treasure is here in this life only, it shows that your heart is here in this life only. You aren't thinking at all about the life to come. And your hoarding of wealth, James says, will be evidence against you in the day of fire, in the day of judgment. You see, fire often represents judgment in the Scriptures. And here James says that the very fact that you have failed to lay up treasures in heaven, but you've accumulated so much here on earth, that will testify against you on the day of judgment. See, folks, the problem is not that these people were wealthy. There's nothing inherently wrong with being wealthy or having money. The problem, folks is how you view that wealth and what you do with that wealth. And these people were hoarders of their wealth. They trusted in their wealth rather than in God. And folks, they valued their riches more than anything else. The irony is clear in verse 3. You have laid up treasure in the last days. You've invested in a time that's drawing to a close. There isn't that much time left in this world, and you're throwing all of your investments into it. You should be investing in the life to come, the life that will last. But instead, you're hoarders of wealth in this life. What a tragedy. And folks, what a tragedy it would be for us if we as Christians were hoarding all of our treasure in this life rather than investing in the life to come. We know that this life isn't going to last, but we often act like it will, don't we? Now folks, after our worship gathering is over, we're going to be having a brief member meeting to vote on a budget for this next year, 2022. And we need to vote as a church to determine how we're going to steward the money that God entrusts to us for the next year. And let me be clear, folks. If you're a believer and you aren't giving financially to your church, you're being disobedient to God. The Bible is clear about this. It tells us that the local church is the primary avenue that God is using today to accomplish his mission on earth. We are told to give generously to the collection of the saints. In fact, in Malachi, God told his people that they were robbing him by withholding their tithes and their offerings. 
See, if you don't give financially to your church, you aren't laying up treasure in heaven in the ways that God has called you to do so. And to be honest, we're also collecting our annual Lottie Moon love offering right now. We all know this. We do it each and every year. This goes to our missionaries. It's one of the main ways that we cooperate with other Southern Baptist churches to support nearly 3,600 missionaries who are sharing the gospel and starting churches around the world. Every single day, these missionaries are storming the gates of hell and seeing people come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering is just one way that you can lay up treasure in heaven. You're cooperating in the mission to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, you may not consider yourself to be rich, But no matter how much money you have, God calls you to lay up treasures in heaven and not on earth alone. So don't follow the mindset of the world and hoard all of your possessions in this life. Invest in eternity. Now folks, we spent quite a bit of time looking at this problem of hoarding wealth because it was a major problem for these wealthy unbelievers. But there are three other problems that James mentions here. Let's see the second one in verse 4. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of of the Lord of hosts. See, many of the wealthy of this time were agricultural landowners. As we see in other parts of the New Testament, they employed day laborers to work the fields, and then they paid them at the end of the workday. We see this in Jesus' parables. But in the case of these landowners, they were keeping back some or all of the wages, and not paying them appropriately for their work. And because these wealthy people were very powerful, there was little the poor workers could do in response. No one would listen to them. The wealthy were essentially above the law at this time. They could get away with robbery as far as the law was concerned. But folks... They couldn't get away with it in God's eyes. See, James says that their wages are crying out against you. You might be thinking back to what this sounds like in the book of Genesis, right? It sounds like the blood of Abel crying out against Cain from the ground. Some of the imagery that James employs here. And he also says that the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. This is an echo of Deuteronomy 24.15, which says this, You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is poor and counts on it, lest he cry against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. These wealthy unbelievers thought they could get away with exploiting the poor. And maybe they can in this life, but they won't get away with it as far as God is concerned. He will repay their evil to them in the coming day of judgment. Now folks, you might be sitting there this morning and you might be thinking, this is a hard situation to apply today. But it really isn't. Do you think you can get away with what you do in secret? Do you think that God doesn't see? Do you think that God doesn't know? God cares tremendously for those who are exploited. Are you somebody who takes advantage of people? 
Do you use your power and your influence to get them to do things for you that aren't right? God sees that. And you may feel like you're getting away with it. But don't fool yourself into thinking that God doesn't know. And exploiting those who are weaker than you is characteristic of the unsaved world. It should never be characteristic of believers. These persecutors were hoarders of wealth. They were exploiters of the poor. There's two more problems in these next two verses. Let's read verse 5. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Now this might be the problem that jumped to your mind when you thought of what the wealthy unsaved might do. Remember the problem is not that these people are wealthy. That's not the problem. The problem is how they view their wealth and what they do with their wealth. And here we see that they were living extravagantly and in luxury and self-indulgence. Now this is exactly what Jesus was describing in his parable of the rich man and Lazarus. You remember that? The rich man spent exorbitant amounts of money on himself while a poor man was starving right outside his door. He never considered the needs that other people had. He just consumed all of his riches by spending them on himself. He was fattening his heart in the day of slaughter. Folks, this is figurative language describing the coming day of judgment. James's point here is that the rich are selfishly and ignorantly going about accumulating wealth for themselves and wastefully spending it on their own pleasures at a time when God's judgment was imminent. And folks, this is why Paul says that we are to be like Christ and to look not only on our own needs, but also on the needs of others. Christians should reflect Jesus by caring about others and not just themselves. So do we do that? Do we consider the needs of others in our church? Do we consider the needs of others in our neighborhood? Do we show Christ's love to them in tangible ways? Or do we only care about ourselves and spending all that we have on the things that we want. See, this profile of the persecutors has shown us that they were hoarders of wealth, exploiters of the poor, and extravagantly self-indulgent. The fourth point here is in verse 6. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Now, we don't know if these rich were actually murdering the poor. That's definitely a possibility. If they were able to defraud them of their wages, it's possible that they could get away with murder as well. But it's also possible that because they were withholding wages, the poor were unable to afford the basic necessities of life, and so they starved to death. And in this way, the rich were murdering the poor. And these poor people hadn't done anything to deserve this treatment. The Bible says they were righteous. They didn't even resist their unjust treatment. How could they? They didn't have any power, and the rich had plenty of power. And they were using that power to oppress the innocent people around them. Folks, as believers, may we never be oppressive people. If you're a successful business owner, praise the Lord. That's a fantastic thing, a fantastic stewardship. Don't use your power to oppress those who work for you. 
Don't leverage your authority to harm them. Be as generous as you can towards them and treat them well. Reflect Christ in the way that you relate to them. If you're a parent, don't oppress your children. Love them and bring them up to know Jesus and to love him. Don't treat them as slaves. Now, of course, teach your children how to work hard and have a strong work ethic. But don't treat them harshly or abuse them. Husbands, don't oppress your wives. Jesus tells men to love their wives as Christ loves the church. And that's in a sacrificial way. Not in a selfish way that uses and abuses them. As Christians, we need to set an example of how to love our spouses. And it's radically different from what we see in our culture. You know, it's normal for an unsafe person with a worldly perspective to act in these ways. It shouldn't surprise us when people who aren't Christians hoard their wealth, exploit other people, live extravagantly and self-indulgently, and oppress innocent people. But if we as Christians are doing these kind of things, we need to repent and ask for God's forgiveness. These behaviors reflect an unsaved world view. So when we experience the kind of persecution that these wealthy unbelievers brought upon these poor Christians, how should we respond? How do we react when we face pain in this life? What's a Christian response to earthly pain? Well, in verses 7 through 11, we're going to see the profile of the patient. We're going to see that the patient do six things in the face of persecution. And we'll move through each one of these rather quickly. First of all, the patient anticipate the Lord's coming. Let's read together verses 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. You know, when I was growing up, I remember my pastor always saying, whenever you see that word, therefore, you should always see what it's there for. <laughs> well, in this case, everything that James has said to the persecutors in verses 1 through 6 about how they'll be judged for their wicked practices, all of that is the ground for what he's now going to say to these believers. In other words, because these people are going to be judged, you can be patient. You can endure you can put up with what you're putting up with. And then James uses a farmer as an illustration. Look at the farmer. He has to be patient and wait for his harvest. He has to wait for the fruit to develop. And he has to wait for the rain that allows his crop to grow. All of that takes patience, and you don't always know how it's going to turn out. That's how we need to be as Christians in waiting for the day of the Lord. Folks, Jesus is coming back and he's going to make all things right. He will judge the wicked and he will vindicate the righteous. And because that's going to happen soon, we can root our hearts in that promise. We don't have to worry that our pain will go unnoticed. God is going to come back and right every wrong so we can be patient until that happens. We can anticipate the Lord's coming. Number two, the patient expect the Lord's 
judgment. Look at verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. You might wonder why James tells Christians not to grumble against each other here. Folks, that's exactly what we tend to do when we're frustrated by our circumstances. Right? We take it out on those closest to us. I think we've seen plenty of that play out in the church across America over the past couple of years. We've been frustrated by the pandemic. We've been frustrated by politics. We've been frustrated by a lot of things. And so we take our frustrations out on our fellow church members. But we shouldn't do that. When evil is done to us and then we grumble against others, we only earn for ourselves judgment for our actions. And James's point is for us to recognize that God's judgment is coming soon. The judge is standing at the door. He's getting ready to execute his just rule. And we should expect this and patiently love our brothers and sisters in Christ in the midst of our pain. Number three, the patient consider the Lord's servants. Look at verse 10. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. James now brings up the Old Testament prophets who consistently suffered so much. Not only at the hands of pagan kings, but also at the hands of God's people. And yet they consistently preached whatever God called them to proclaim. And James mentions the prophets because they teach us something important. See, doing God's will will often lead to suffering. What we need to do is be willing to bear up under the suffering, keep our integrity, and wait patiently for the Lord to intervene. He may choose to let us continue in that suffering for a time. And He has the right to do that. Ultimately, we're His servants. And we're called to remain faithful no matter what just like the prophets of old. Number four, the patient count on the Lord's favor. Please look with me at verse 11. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. See, folks, we may endure pain in this life when we serve God, but we can always count on the fact that God sees our faithfulness and He rewards it. The reward may not come in the form that we want or expect. We may not be rewarded with a new car or even the removal of our pain. But God does Bless those who remain steadfast. We need to cherish this promise when the pain of our lives makes it difficult to see the good in our trials. Number five, the patient focus on the Lord's ends. Look again down at the middle of verse 11. He starts, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast, You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord. You know, a lot of times when we think about Job, we think about how he questioned God, or how he comes off as a little bit self-righteous in the middle of his sufferings. But the truth is, even though Job wasn't perfect, his responses weren't always right, He never abandoned his faith in God, and he continued to hope in God in the midst of his darkest days. 
And in the end, God rewarded his faithfulness and blessed him with more after his trials than he had before his trials. See, folks, your present suffering is not the end of the story. God has much to accomplish through your suffering. And it may not end in you being wealthy like Job, but it may end in a tremendous growth of spiritual maturity. When we're going through the trial, we need to focus on what God is doing through it. So, the patient anticipate the Lord's coming. They expect the Lord's judgment. They consider the Lord's servants. They count on the Lord's favor. They focus on the Lord's ends. And finally, they ponder the Lord's character. Let's read verse 11 one final time. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord. How the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Remember, even though it may not feel like it in the middle of your pain, God is a compassionate and merciful God. How do you know that? How do we know that's the case? See, while you were a sinner, deserving of everlasting punishment and separation from God for all eternity, while you were in that state, God sent Jesus, his only son, to earth as a human baby. That's what we're celebrating this month. Jesus grew up. He perfectly fulfilled his father's will. And that ended in his crucifixion on a cross and his burial in a tomb. But you see, because Jesus died for your sins in your place, if you place your faith in Jesus alone, you will not spend eternity dying for your sins as you deserve. No, instead you will live forever with Jesus, the one who raised from the dead to conquer death for those of us who place our faith in him alone. This, folks, is a reward that none of us deserves. This is true mercy and compassion. And that same compassionate and merciful God is the one who empowers us to live each day even when we face tremendous trials and persistent pain. So if you're here today and you've never trusted in Jesus to save you from your sins, why don't you pray to him today? Why don't you cry out to him in prayer? Admit that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus is the only one who can save you from your sins. And confess him as your Lord. You know, if you do that, this will be the best Christmas of your life. Because God will save you from your sins. And if you're here today, and you're a believer... Remember that God sees you in your pain. He doesn't ignore it. And he's going to return in his time, and he's going to right every wrong. So be patient and wait on the ever-merciful and ever-compassionate God. Let's pray together. Father, in this passage of James, we thank you for the admonitions of what it looks like to reject your truth and to live for ourselves. Help us not to live as the example we saw in the first six verses of this passage. But I pray that we would embrace the admonitions of verses 7 through 11. That we would learn to wait on you in our pain. We'd learn to trust in you when we don't see the purpose for what's going on, that we learn to praise you in that moment. Father, we thank you for the chance we've had to worship you together as your people. I pray for any here today who 
perhaps have attended, but they've never personally accepted you as their Savior. They've never personally turned from their sins and trusted in Jesus alone to save them. I pray that they might do so today. That they might find everlasting life through the salvation provided through Jesus alone. May you be glorified through our response to your word this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join me in standing together as we sing a concluding song. time we're going to move into our final time of communion in the year 2021. I'll also say this is uh, the end of another era. Uh, I think this is our last batch of COVID communion and uh, you can praise the Lord for that. That's fine. Uh, next year we look forward to the opportunity to uh, observe the Lord's Supper in a way that's more familiar to uh, yesteryear. But uh, let's rejoice in the Lord's providence that we can this way today. In the letter of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes the following, But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat, For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. We don't have time to walk through everything that we just read there, but Paul was not commending the Corinthians because they weren't coming together in unity to celebrate what Christ had done for all of them combined. They were doing it privately. They were doing it in small groups with what they wanted to do. Folks, this is an ordinance of the church. We gather together as one and remember what Christ has done for us in unity. And what has Christ done for us? Well, he continues, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, folks, this month we're celebrating Jesus' coming to earth as a baby, but that coming culminated in what we're celebrating right now, and that's Jesus being lifted up as a serpent was lifted up in the wilderness to die and take upon himself the sins that you and I committed. What we're doing here is a celebration that Jesus took upon himself the wrath of God so that you and I would not have to take on the wrath of God. We could be justified. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So this is not a time of sorrow. 
or permanent sorrow. It's a time of deep rejoicing for what Jesus has done for us. And as often as we gather together and observe the Lord's Supper, we are proclaiming the gospel until he comes back and he takes us to himself. And so I invite you to take your elements here and just as a matter of instruction for one final time, there's a clear plastic on the top. If you pull that off, you can gain access to the bread. And Jesus took that bread and he said, this is my body, which is given in exchange for yours. This eat in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this is my blood spilled for you. The life I spill in my blood is your life now, so you can live forever. So take and drink. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that because Jesus took your wrath on himself, we would never have to face your wrath if we are in Christ Jesus. We thank you that because his blood was spilled, we will not have to die forever, we will live forever. What a glorious truth that is that we can celebrate here at the conclusion of the year 2021. And Father, if you tarry and you allow us to continue to wait patiently and we come to the year 2022, we'll continue to observe the supper remembering the truth of the gospel that you're coming back again. And we're not resting in our works. We're not resting in our goodness. We're resting in the body and blood of Jesus Christ sacrificed for us. So may you be glorified through each and every observance that our church has of your supper. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for being here as we've gathered to worship the Lord together as a church. In a few minutes, we're going to have a brief member meeting. Uh, That'll be exactly five minutes after the conclusion of the announcement video today. So if you have to get out the door, you've got a roast that's going to burn and you you can't wait. Feel free to get out then. If you want to get up and stretch, please feel free to do so. If you're in the balcony and you want to come down on the main level, whatever it is, we invite you to do that in those five minutes after the announcement video. There'll be a countdown on the screen. But as we close, I do want to pray for a couple of things that I know is near and dear to our hearts those who were affected by the results of the tornadoes across the Midwest over the past week, devastating. We want to uphold them in prayer. And we want to continue to pray for our Lottie Moon Christmas offering and our foreign missionaries, that God would bless our efforts to see the gospel go out to the ends of the earth. So let's bow together one final time here. Father, we thank you again for how you care for us and you love us and you demonstrate that even in the midst of the literal physical storms of life. This past week we saw great devastation across the Midwest and we recognize that there were many homes that were destroyed, many businesses that were destroyed. There were people who entered eternity through the storm. Father, we thank you for the safety that you gave to so many of us the safety that you gave to our possessions even. We give you thanks for that. But we recognize that there are many who are suffering and and we pray for them. We lift them up to you and we ask that you would see their pain and provide for their needs. Even as we as Southern Baptists are pooling our funds to see those needs met, we pray that you would continue to strengthen us to do that and provide for them. Father, we pray for our missionaries scattered across this globe, many whose names we will never know, and many of this world will never know, but you know them, and you see them, and you see their efforts to spread the greatest message in the world to the ends of the earth. I pray that you would prosper them at this time. 
I pray that you'd use our giving, our faithful giving above and beyond what we normally give to see those efforts expanded, to see the gospel go to places where it never has before, that your name might be exalted. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Before Christ, I lived in a house with a demon. When I was growing up in a Hindu family, a demon possessed my mom every week. Hindus actually believed my mom was a goddess and they called me son of the goddess. I was 25 years old when someone shared the gospel with me and Christ changed me and my entire family. I was no longer the son of the goddess but son of the living God. As a new believer, I didn't know where to start but God called men and women into my life to disciple me, to teach me and to walk alongside me as I shared Christ with friends, family and strangers. When God called me into ministry, these men and women, these missionaries became my close friends and partners. We looked out over big cities and tiny villages, choking on false beliefs they had inherited and we begged God to breathe life into them and God answered. God used us and other believers to draw a harvest of dozens, hundreds and thousands to Christ. Together with my partners, I organized these Christians into house churches. We encouraged them in evangelism and we discipled them in God's word. The churches kept growing and the gospel kept going out. Dawn has come for gospel work in South Asia. Join your South Asian brothers and sisters. Join the IMB as laborers in the greatest harvest field in the world. Now is the time. Now it's your turn. Hey First Baptist, let's talk about what's going on at our church. We are right in the middle of collecting funds for our annual Lottie Moon Love Offering for our missionaries. Our church has been a strong supporter of worldwide missions for decades. And we want to continue that support for our missionaries by sending them a good offering this Christmas. Our goal is to raise $4,000 this year. Please consider praying about what God might lead you to give. Now tonight, we'll be continuing our children's program, Adventure Club, and our student ministries at 6 o'clock p.m. This is our last week of evening ministries for the year 2021. Our Christmas Eve candlelight service with lots of Christmas carols and the Christmas story will be returning this year on December 24th at 6 p.m. We'd love to see you there for this special night. Now today, we'll be having a brief church member meeting five minutes after this worship gathering to vote on the proposed 2022 budget and ministry teams. These are both posted in the hallway off the lobby, and there are sheets available for you to look at as well. Finally, if you're new here at First Baptist, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. I would love to meet you as you leave today. Have a great week, First Baptist. <laughs>